Welcome to the One Within All. You're listening to Interverse, Season 3, Episode 25. Our guest today is Amelie Grace, a wonderful human reservoir of calming wisdom who shares information online in astrology, self-transformation, and a very interesting synthesis of ancient wisdom traditions called Gene Keys. I have followed your videos online for several months now, and I've been very interested in getting you for a conversation. I really wanted to thank you for your time on this numerologically synchronistic day, 1111, and we're even beginning our talk at 11 in your time zone. So suffice to say, I'm really excited to dig into your mystical awareness and story of personal evolution and transformation. I think your messages about overcoming victim mentality and judgmental mindsets would be very helpful to those of us who are walking the path of spiritual evolution. And I've also got to mention the mystical music that you co-create called Entheo, which the audience will have gotten a small taste of in the intro here. With so many gifts that you share, it's hard to know where to start. So I'll just say, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Chance. It's good to be here. What's new in your life these days? I've (laughs) been eagerly awaiting the next video to explain the Gene Keys. Maybe we should start with that. Mm -hmm. With the Gene Keys, it's sort of like a rabbit hole into whole universe of um, awareness. So (laughs) do you want to um, open into the Gene Keys as a a system, as a transmission? I think we could maybe even start a little more foundationally because astrology is not something I've spoken a whole lot about on my show with guests yet. I mean, we've touched on certain aspects of it, but what would you give as a evidential or explanatory power to how the movements of heavenly bodies and the time cycles that we're in actually reflect within the individual lives that are embedded within the one greater uh, universal life? (laughs) That's a great question. I mean, that is how I witness it. I really see astrology as this ability to speak an archetypal language that helps us to be aware of of the cycles that we are engaged in in our in the different aspects of our human psyche going through different phases of growth i think you named it really well when when you said how the heavenly body is mirror something internally happening in me i i view it as a holographic relationship that it's not like there's these bodies out there in the sky and they're like doing things to us and i think a lot of people are like, oh God, I'm having a a Uranus transit. Uranus is really messing with me right now. And I think that it's actually more, we are in touch. There's a synchronicity occurring where the mirror of Uranus in the sky as it relates to my divine blueprint is allowing my access to my inner revolutionary or liberator to be undergoing a process. And so our awareness of that, that's part of what astrology is, is we put our mind on it, we see the clues and we follow those threads to gain more insight into how to navigate our human experience with more clarity, with more grace, and you know, with the context of what's going on is always so helpful for me. I'm all about spiritual context. I like how you explain that as bringing attention and awareness to the potential for transformation in each moment in this segment of linear time that we're experiencing. And I think the heavenly body correlate to life experiences and changes in personal consciousness is very similar to the correlation between the brain and consciousness, where it cannot be proven decisively that the brain creates or generates consciousness, but also you can't completely rule out the connection between mental states and neurochemicals and substances with states of consciousness. So they're like a holographic, synchronistic representation of each other. They're not actually separate and you can't separate them. So that's the entire problem to begin with. And when it comes to, you know, what's going on, if you happen to look up, what it does is give you, if you are able to interpret those archetypes and see the way that they are impacting and influencing your journey at that point, then you have the opportunity with your attention to send energy to the transformative aspect of those archetypes, as opposed to being caught in repetitive thought cycles that lower vibrational archetypes are also, because all the archetypes have 
two aspects. So if you're in unconsciousness, then your attention is flowing towards the unconscious aspects of the archetype. And if you're like your addictions and things like that, and if you're conscious, then you're going into the transformative, which means that you're finding new ways to create and you're creating a new identity for yourself in that moment and not being caught in the pattern. So it's like you can't prescribe somebody's future with astrology, but you can prescribe their opportunities in a sense and your own and having that attention to what's possible and expanding out of the box that we put our imaginations in through cultural conditioning allows you to send energy to the transformation because energy flows where attention is directed, which is basically a proven concept in quantum physics. Oh, the power of awareness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a lot of this work, it's like, you don't really have to do a lot. Like there are moments of choice, right? That like where the road kind of separates into do I continue this unconscious pattern or this limiting pattern or do I make a new choice? There's choices that we make, but that awareness has a power unto itself that all we really need to do when it comes to the consistent cultivation of our consciousness is to be aware, be willing to meet ourselves exactly where we are. And I think that's where I notice the conditioning really come into play with how we're inhibited to meet the moment because our conditioning most in, uh, you know, and I can speak for Western culture or just the culture I was brought in is very um, uncomfortable with the uncomfortable, you know? So anything that doesn't feel right or is misaligned or has the discomfort in the body, the emotions, the mind, there's this tendency to want to hide from it or to really fight against it and be, you know, have the fear or anger, you know, it's like, and that in the Jane Keys is the repressive and reactive natures of all the 64 shadow states. And when you're talking astrology, this is the, the repressive reactive of the shadow qualities of the planets or the signs, you know, you can use that same language. And so I've noticed that in my work of cultivation, so much of it is my willingness to get honest, not just in the mind, but also honest and willing to feel gut honesty down in the guts, willing to just go, okay, this is the karma. This is the conditioning this is the unworthiness or whatever I'm transforming, I'm willing to go there and be with that. So that I'm bringing in a whole like stream that I've really discovered inside of the Gene Keys transmission that's come alive in me and how I navigate, you know, everything you're saying, consciousness and awareness and how to make it through mm -hmm. into um, rising out of being a victim and choosing the course that we want to take. There's a lot to unpack about what you said there. I'll start with what you were describing with a gut knowing mentality. I think that coming into balance in yourself and also being able to feel like you described as being a necessary component. It's like redirecting your awareness of, in your conscious you know, field from just a brain-based survival only mentality and decision making to being able to feel what's right and wrong for yourself and others with your conscience and your heart and actually care about that. And then having the intuitive power, and that's the gut knowing, to know that your intention to change and let go will be, let go of what is harmful will be uh, possible and that it will occur. That's actually, the intuition is also like extension of the power of the imagination in this sense and allows you to step into your knowing and immediately transform whatever it is that's holding you back. And a lot of the aspects of this growth that we're talking about are really not involved with what you must do or what you must, I mean, to an extent, what you know is important because knowledge is liberating, but the real enlightenment comes from stopping things that are harmful, really. It's a destructive process in a sense. You're bringing light to what's no longer in the best service of yourself and those around you and then transforming it removing it in a sense, cleaning it up. 
Lots of cleanup. <laughs> yeah, cleaning up our relations. That was the uh, name of your, or that was involved in the name of your last video, actually. And that is a big aspect of it, but it's not just about our relations between ourselves, um, individual humans. It's also our relation to the planet and to animals and plants. I think that what we're facing is the whole of our human course over the last, you know, how many centuries or whatnot is operating inside of a, a density that at one time, I love how the Jinkies really pulls out like that shadow at one time was necessary to our evolution. It was the evolutionary impulse. So like the need for to dominate, we had to dominate in order to survive as a species, the need to be codependent, you know, we had to depend on each other, like all these, at one time, these things served. So it's good not to judge all of the darkness. And I think it's like, it's such a huge part of the unwinding is making, making the things that are off balance wrong is actually just perpetuating the whole thing. So what, like, but witnessing where we have become that these shadow frequencies no longer are serving our evolution and they're kind of the like the thing that just is going to keep us from leaping into our next stage of evolution. So there's this sort of battle. I would call it interference is one of the big, that was the word that we were talking about in that Gene Keys video around cleaning our relations is just the interference and corruption inside of the human aura. Let's say a, a little intention prayer that our uh, Interverse listeners can also get into. It's right now 1111 on 1111. So with that being said, I'd like to just allow everyone to take this moment to send your awareness to your intuitive knowing that you can release addictive and harmful thought patterns and that you can transform this shadow. Coherence. The gateway of the 11 to slip into that center place of knowing that allows for interference to be harmonized into a coherent signal between those of us who are gathering on the planet for a great change and to feel that signal in this moment. To find the interference in your life, just look for where you find the fear inside you, interference. And to come together in coherence, you must hear together, which means we must be aligned with the same message of truth from, again, within. Yeah. That's right. Cool. <laughs> yeah, sweet. All right, 11, 12. Let's... <laughs> Back to a regular podcast Back to another program. another reg regular intentional moment. <laughs> so I'd actually like to... Uh, pop off a question here that I wrote down. How would yeah. you explain your spiritual mission for incarnating on earth to a stranger that you just met? <laughs> to a stranger. Uh, yeah, that's a weird With word, no right? No context of where they're at, like spiritually or anything? Yeah, so it would have to maybe be simplified perhaps, but we can expand on it as if the stranger was interested. Yeah. Ooh, what a good question. <laughs> Yeah, so my spiritual mission on this planet. It's kind of hard to nail it down to just one, right? Well, I, I can say that where I'm pulled always right to the center is the, to realize myself as a creator. And in that, the capacity to develop, the capacity to really utilize all of the trauma on the planet, all of the disease and imbalance on the planet to utilize it as a substance of creation, as fuel inside the art process of becoming the most cultivated and integrated 
actualized being that I can be. That would be kind of a, a synopsis. I totally understand the flow of that as in the negative energy and the what we perceive as darkness is actually a form of fuel. Even fear itself is fuel. That's You'll notice you actually get an energetic jolt whenever you go into a fear consciousness. And that might be from having a fight or flight reaction, but you can actually bring awareness and attention to it and ground it. And actually things like this are really useful for that. Black stones like this uh, onyx sphere I have right here allow you mm -hmm. to maintain that intention in a stronger way, in my opinion, because you have an exterior symbol of it that you can represent as that, just like we we're talking about correlations between the stars and, and life. You can also correlate states of consciousness that you want to maintain or achieve with metaphysical tools like different crystals and stones. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. The, the significance of altars and how they alter our consciousness when we open up to how it's a, a resonance, uh, a, an anchoring of a, a divine resonance that can, when we talk about it, Wonderland, because we have um, in our both of our community houses, we have art on all the walls. Very, and we talk about transmission art. Um, rather than visionary art, it's transmission art. It's art that carries a transmission. And it's the process of making the art that's part of that transmission. And it's, you know, it is the product itself. But these pieces that go on the wall are these statues or these crystals they are literally emanating a transmission of frequency into our spaces therefore when you come into a field like wonderland it's like whoa okay there's all of a sudden more coherence inside of this container for me to do my work and be in this transformational alchemy and that's that goes as well for community structure that the, because I live inside of a community of people who all constellate together around the shared mission of self-awareness, of uh, self-transformation and actualization, I can do so much more work inside this community than I would if I was out on my own because it's literally like living inside of an altar or of a, you know an art museum with all these living, artifacts and beings that are giving off this they're anchoring a resonance of that intention that i am aiming my life at so again the, the coherency generators and the power of our altars absolutely wow what you just talked about is something that's really been coming up a lot for me lately which is the true power of the temple in a sense and the community power in in that and also the phrase that you just gave me, transmission art, is something I've never heard before, but conceptually it completely makes sense. And it even I would even now want to start describing my artwork as transmission art because I more channel my art than I do plan it, if that makes sense. So on that note, I actually spoke with my previous guest or two podcasts back, an artist named Adam Millward from Canada who makes beautiful mandalas and stuff. He, uh, he and I spoke about Cosm and Alex and Allison Gray's amazing temple there and all the transform, transformative energy that exists in that place. And he talked about wanting to create his own temple. But what I actually just learned about between talking about that with him and talking about this with you was on a podcast I listened to called Mysterious Universe, they interviewed a, uh, an author and researcher of um, ancient culture's information storing techniques. And basically, she has decoded information out of several sacred sites like Stonehenge and other like places all around the world of that antiquity. And it's found that using ancient memory practices where you encode things that you want to remember into a visual representation like an area that you're familiar with, and you put one piece of information on one thing and another on another thing in the room or in the area. And in your mind, you can visualize walking through that place and you can tap into all the information that you've saved there. 
And it's really crazy. This woman was actually just listing off huge amounts of information, statistics, things that she had memorized that no normal, at least currently normal person has the power to do. And she's done it all through the power of making little stories and making songs and making visual representations in her mind of these uh, data sets and pieces of information she wants to remember. She was like reciting the Latin names of every species of duck in Australia, like crazy stuff like that. And uh, <laughs> I know, I know. And so in these uh, ancient sacred sites, these what we're calling temples, but we're relating to religions of the book, like Christianity and Judaism and Islam. And, you know, we're superimposing that Western religious mindset onto these sacred sites and give, getting the wrong idea about them. They were actually places where people were storing ancient wisdom and ancestor wisdom. And they actually, one of the ways that they remembered big amounts of information like related to agriculture or migration or survival in any number of things was by associating it with ancestors. And by doing that, they would have both a tool to remember the genealogy of hundreds and hundreds of years. There's some tribes that are still around today that can tell you their genealogy for a thousand years and every person. So, and they would also have the ability to remember exactly what to do if this one crop goes bad in a, in a season. So it's like, it's just remarkable. Encyclopedias of knowledge that are accessible through this transmission that is created in these sacred spaces that we're barely even beginning to unlock and understand in this modern age. Mm hmm. Ah, wow. I have to link that book by this author in the show notes. I just can't remember her name, but it was mind blowing. Mm hmm. Yeah, that definitely brings me in contact with the living wisdom that is a, an unbroken current of consciousness, the lineage of light, the unbroken stream of consciousness that has always been flowing. You know, we, we see stars and the light from the stars literally touches our photons. That is an unbroken stream of light and the same, you know, and it is information inside of that light. And um, that also sparked in me the Tibetan Buddhists talk about that as termas and a terma is a hidden treasure. Padmasambhava was one of the masters who would like plant these termas throughout the ages of consciousness. And, and when you're talking about temples, it's almost like they're physical termas. They were like built so that people could not even admit. It's like, I hit you as a matter and now you're transmitting your energy. A lot of termas can be invisible as well. Like the gene keys is a living terma. It is a seed that was packed in you know, it was like a time release capsule that was set to unlock at a certain time in history when the human mind would be available, you know, for mm -hmm. that kind of wisdom and the readiness in our evolutionary story to that that wisdom would be applied and support us in our journey. So it's funny when people like get the gene keys and they want to know about the gene keys, it's like, whoa, it's definitely more than a book. It is yeah. a living, living wisdom transmission that has an incredible capacity for massive transformation on the planet. And it acts as a, as a terma in that we are all transmissions of our particular code. Like, you know, when you're talking about the lineages, like we carry a specific treasure, a specific hidden treasure each of us. And that's kind of like a rare, interesting thing about this time is the awakening of mass consciousness. It's not just like a few people here and there that people talk about the next Buddha will be a Sangha, will be an, an entire community will awaken, you know? And I really see that as collective unified awareness. People are all waking up at once. And so it's like this individual termas are like unlocking and these transmissions of light are just pouring through and new things that have never been conceived merged with very old things that have always been conceived and known as true are all just like merging. And so it really um, comes back to supporting everyone to discover what that outpouring of 
creative soul, you know, that wants to emerge from them and supporting the fact that we are creators in that. And what a powerful society and community to walk around in with people who are like walking temples. People that are like walking temples. That is kind of how the author that I was just bringing up described some of the elders of ancient cultures. They would, wow. and they would just walk around these uh, sacred sites and they would like the common people would just hold on to certain stories. What we would consider now children's stories or fairy tales that are in mythology that yeah. they would relate to this part of the temple and this part of the temple. And as they walked through it, they would remember the whole story. But yeah. the elders would actually know the deeper, uh, hidden esoteric wisdom encoded in the story. And that was transmitted on and on through secret societies and mystery traditions up to the present day when it would finally be accessible in mass because, you know, certain types of this, like certain things that we've talked about already today, a few hundred years ago, someone would like kill us for talking about, which is crazy. I, yeah. It's crazy. But uh, we, yeah. so we're in a, a really rare time where we actually can unfold the gifts that we've been carrying and seed to seed passed from generation to generation. And we've had certain tools for thousands of years that have been essential to people who are looking to accelerate this process of mass consciousness. The gene keys, I don't understand quite exactly what they are, but I understand that it has something to do with the days of the year, uh, specific days carrying certain energy. And also with 64 uh, keys makes me think it might be related to I Ching. <laughs> yeah. Um, because yeah. it seems like a synthesis of many ideas. And I Ching is something I'm quite familiar with and would be interested in maybe going into talking about that a little bit. But uh, first, I want to start with the astrology of specific days of the year, because just the other day I was in a store and I picked up a book that was about every birthday and the specific aspects of what people born on certain days carry. And every one of them I read, especially my own, was so spot on that I was like, Wow, this is way more than just being an Aries cusp Pisces. This is like 322. This is like, uh, this is my mission. You know, it's pretty interesting how numerology plays into um, our life path and our personality in ways that as soon as you start looking into it and you're honest with yourself, with your intuition, you'll recognize massive synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's so many people that have come along and really been able to interpret the many different layers of astrology in all of these unique different ways. And one of those that reminds me of what you're talking about is the Sabian symbols. And there's many interpretations of the Sabian symbols, which is every single degree of the Zodiac has this like one line of poetry, mm. like a group of people gathered around a campfire or like, um, you know, there's, then there's more creative, inter, or not creative, but like then people have gone off to like channel, like, oh, like wild grapes, um, full on the vine, you know, things like that. And then there's a whole write up of like, there's certain things I've found that is like so fun in the game of Oracle, in the game of like mm -hmm. synchronicity and, oh, how does this add a layer of insight into knowing that my sun is at zero degrees Libra, you know, or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the mind is so creative and we can see the layers in so many different ways. And certain people have really hit it right on the head. And it goes to say that every sign is a progression from I'm a baby in this area to all the way I have matured and I understand this force of this particular mm -hmm. style of consciousness. And now I'm going to like cusp into that. I'm a baby in this next one. So from zero to 29, it's a whole journey and there's, you know, sections of, you know, that helps us decode our signs a little bit more and our planetary positions. Yeah. I know with yeah. my life as um, as an Aries that is very close to Pisces on 322, that's the end of the Zodiac and the beginning of the Zodiac. So <laughs> my entire life feels like a constant state of complete restart, upheaval, and kind of renewing and rebirth. It's 
Uh Yeah, I love that point of the Zodiac. And I I always equate it to the Ouroboros where the snake is eating its tail. And it's that place where all creation sort of just like implodes (laughs) into that zero point. So that's a powerful place to exist. And it sounds like it's been quite a ride for you, but that renewal and regeneration that's available through you um, and that is powerful. Yeah, I love that part of the zodiac. It's the 25th gene key, which moves from constriction at the shadow to the gift of acceptance and the city of universal love. Wow, I did not know that. So I'm actually planning on getting the gene key book. I'm just uh, about three books deep right now. (laughs) You know how it is. It's um, a tome. It's a reference um, and, a, and a tome of wisdom. So, so you don't really read it all at it once. Anytime, you, will not read it one, you will not read it front to back. Okay, That's maybe I'll not, pick it up right away. Yeah, it's something that you can do the bibliomancy, just oracle flip to any page. I know a ton of people that do that. And then you can also read the keys that you have planets um, inhabiting, uh, which means that those particular rays of um, consciousness, those particular archetypes are very, they are the way that you're working out your stuff. They're mm-hmm. your blueprint. They're your um, main obstructions to your light and they're the quality of your light as it shines. So, I mean, I think that it might be a good time to just kind of break down that the Gene Keys is a synthesis teaching, it's a self transformation technology that uses the precision of the language of light precisely with 64 different genetic archetypes that relate to the hexagrams of the I Ching. So it's a modern interpretation to the I Ching, but overlaid elementally in a certain logarithmic function pattern onto the zodiac so that then you can actually translate where your planets are and there's basically five and a half gene keys that take up or hexagrams as well that take up a certain sign of the zodiac and 64 circle the whole um, 360 degrees of the zodiac that's like the technical kind of like calculation side of things like okay my son like your son is probably in the 25th gene key which in the gene keys that's your life's work and also doubles as your brand. So that's a very important thing to contemplate. But the whole like stepping back and, and really entering into the Gene Keys is like, you're summoning the forces of evolution and involution to start to uh, operate inside of you. And you are accessing a tool of, as I said, precision. We call it archetypal acupuncture because the laser like focus of the language that points to specific aspects of the human psyche in a way that's really never been so precise in in the sense that we talk about ego, we talk about shadow, we talk about the 12 of the zodiac, but we're talking 64 different (laughs) genetic human archetypes. And So you get to have this very specific, and as far as in my six years of deep study immersion in this um, has been incredibly accurate. It's so accurate, just on point. Everyone's just like, oh, nailed me. I watch your videos for months and they are completely (laughs) accurate whenever you talk about the gene keys of, you know, that particular instant in time. It always relates to what type of uh, information seems to be going on for me right then so and to an extent all of the gene keys would probably carry wisdom that you'd be able to synthesize and incorporate into your own personal transformation regardless of when you read them like you said the bibliomancy aspect Mm -hmm. but that is probably a tie into um the fact that the I Ching is the same way you can look into the meaning Mm -hmm. of any of the elemental configurations of the eight primary elements that are used to create the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching And from a Western perspective, you might look at the eight positions, although we have only five elements in classical Western philosophy, there are actually eight arconic forces 
in play, you could say. And that's uh, the arconic aspect maybe is the more shadow side where we are kind of bounced around between these positions of uh, 64 possibilities in this eight by eight cubic holographic construct that we're in. <laughs> but we are able to send our energy back up to the higher aspect of ourselves and transform those arconic energies into angelic, helpful energies in a sense. And that's where I think the tie-in between the Western uh, mystical experience and canon can be attached to the Eastern uh, I Ching eight element concept. And so there's basically, you can look at it as there are these eight internal and external forces that are at work and they're tied into the planets and they're tied into your organs and they're tied into different emotional states, both positive and negative. And as you are moving from one moment to the next, there's a constant shifting going on from one point of these 64 position grid to another. And you can transmit your energy from any one of these positions to any of the others at any time. They're not necessarily linear. So the I Ching is a great tool to see a reflection of where you might be standing and where you might be attempting to evolve towards. And I've used it for many years myself, actually probably four or five years, maybe three or four, uh, in the form of a tarot I Ching that has teaching from Osho uh, synthesized into mm -hmm. each card. And it's been super powerful. It was one of the first metaphysical tools I ever got. But it sounds like the Gene Keys is like a, a definite information upgrade and would really tie into a lot of things I've been researching for years now. I'm interested to get into it because oh. I might find myself talking about it quite a bit on the show to people. Chance, I think you are poised and ready for this. <laughs> I mean, like, it is one of the beautiful things about it is that it's telling the human evolution story it's telling the story of consciousness as it's evolved throughout time so it's really sharing with us like a a really poetic and gorgeous way to see where we are in the larger cycle of time and what is our role right now and the beautiful thing is that we use this metaphor of the dna and how the i ching and the DNA are actually mirrors of each other. Yes. It works in binary code in sets of three. It has 64 codons in the, in the genome and 64 hexagrams. It's a similar code, right? So like obviously the ancient Chinese were tapped into something very yeah. profound. And, you know, this isn't, we can't talk about the gene keys as science because it's just not science. It's spiritual science. It's for me, I'm a subjective scientist. I'm like, yo, I'm going to call this science. My experiment of my consciousness proved this correct. I'm going to track my own, but that might not be the science for the, for everyone else. So basically well, that's, what I'm you're describing the difference between materialistic science and um, I, in my opinion, real science, because it's all subjective because it's all right. everything that we're it's experiencing is in our mind. Quantum reality. Observer and observed are not separate. So, so yeah, uh, right. go on though. And actually, I also want to add that DNA was yeah. actually conceptualized by Francis Crick while having a mystical LSD experience. So that, that's something I did not know. That is so cool. The structure of DNA <laughs> came to him in a mystical Whoa. transmission and he saw it. Yeah, so he wasn't the first to describe it. He was just the first to realize what it was on a molecular level, maybe. Dope. That is so cool. <laughs> and you can just picture like the ancient sages of, or, you know, the Taoist monks, like back in thousands of years ago, just in some kind of mystical state seeing this code. And so the cool, like, you know, thing that the Gene Keys is, is mirroring this 64 archetypes of human consciousness that the I Ching has brought through on an elemental basis and mirroring it saying, oh, inside of us, wired into our very physicality, are 64 basic archetypes. We are all of them. We are the holographic expression of all the myriad ways that that can be. 
It's sort of the substance or the code language of creation. The thing about the Jinkies that's super cool is that it interprets these 64 archetypes along a spectrum of frequency. So it's saying, yes, we have the 64, but each 64 has the capacity to operate from the highest, most divine realms of expression all the way to the most dense and shadow-like. So each one has a ray that, if picture it like, I really like picturing inside of your body, you have your DNA. And if you are in a low vibration state for whatever reason, shitty attitude, you ate something wrong, you haven't done your practice, your physical body is operating at a lower frequency. So literally inside your DNA, that the frequency is is dense and slow and low and what happens and i'm i'm speaking like absolutely you might just picture this as a metaphor it might be true but it really metaphorically really makes sense to me is it that, makes your hands shake because your frequency is slower oh because when it's faster it seems like it's completely still because it's just yeah, I experience so this all that. the time. I'm actually having it a little bit right now because I haven't had my Qigong practice for days. <laughs> right. I'm, so I like I know exactly right. what you're saying. It's and a it's a nervous buzz. Yeah. Let me let me uh, continue because what it is is that the code inside of our DNA may be kind of like squished. It doesn't have a lot of space. It doesn't have. It's not operating at its higher functioning. So it goes oh a a T G O. Oh, I didn't totally get you. Okay, Meh. like it. <clears throat> the the DNA literally cannot fully function, and so we're operating at low frequencies, which has all sorts of different chemical and you know like consequences inside of our body. You make any sort of shift to raise your frequency, you do your qigong. You know, you get a good night's rest. You change your attitude. Like that's the big one. Is your literally breathing into your DNA molecules and creating more spaciousness, now the code can start to move. Now it can speak its what it wanted to say, what it was meant to say, it's encoded to say. All the way up to the highest frequencies, the Jinkies have the 64 cities and they're like totally out there, divine um, capacities. This is like all the the qualities of the Buddhas, the Christ, you know, like the Merlin the, is the magician in the tarot, all, the magician, all of the highest capacities of the masters that have lived on the planet and are, you know, part of our whole mythos of divinity is literally encoded into our physicality. And it's just based on frequency that if we can reach a certain love like high frequency and i don't want it to be like oh we have to go up it's not necessarily up it's just a rarefied frequency then we can actually have miracle capacities you know we start to emanate with unconditional love or with justice or you know these different like the 64 cities so that Another gives you an idea of how the 64 are translated practically into our consciousness. That was actually a really useful explanation for me personally to um, just, it always helps to have another layer of understanding and scaffolding of sort of allegorical or metaphorical, or in this case, practically a literal explanation of how our light operates within and without and how it expresses in our physical bodies and in our experiences and in our abilities and in our consciousness or unconsciousness, a way of uh, describing the frequency aspect of your personal energetic frequency. If you're looking at frequency from uh, maybe a mathematical perspective, it's a waveform and then there's a line in the middle that represents the center of the frequency. And you can look at the center of your of this waveform as your source in a sense it's the middle it's your heart it's your ability to care which is what gives you the power to do anything and the faster the higher your frequency is what that means is the waveform is hitting the line more frequently 
And you can look at that as synchronicities in the external world <laughs> and as positive, uplifting, encouraging thoughts about yourself and others on the internal world and impressions that are like sometimes completely mystical. You can get inner impressions of entire other realms if your frequency is hitting that line rapidly enough that it's practically just staying on it. That's when you start having entirely new levels of imagination and impression, which are actually the same thing, their type of perceptual ability that we, um, that we have. The imagination is your co-creative, perceptual, intuitive, mystical manifestation magic in a sense. And that's something I talk about a lot is the importance of imagination and freeing it from the prison of impossibility, thinking that things, being so convinced that things are impossible that we don't even begin to imagine how to change things in our, our daily life and especially in our world. And of course, changing things in the world requires being able to make the inner transformation for yourself. But because it's one unified field of consciousness in life, the more your frequency is hitting the source, the more you're expressing the source into the world, the more other people are consciously witnessing the source, which is uh, counts as a frequency spike for them. Because they're mm. if they're looking at you expressing source, then they are also their consciousness is going up in frequency automatically. So that's why you can have like mystical transformative experiences from listening or witnessing music that is of uh, transmission nature, I think. Maybe a good way to segue into talking about the music that you guys create within Theo. But also you can riff on anything you like. We can get to that later. Yeah, I, that reminds me, my one of our collaborators and dear brother, um, Elijah Parker, who you should check out his material because he works with the Bagua of the um, I Ching inside of the Jinkies. Um, he uh, talks about how because the improvisational improvisational music that we create as a community and that he creates was created inside of a flow state, which is the beta, no, alpha. Will you remind me? It goes from... Flow state is gamma. Gamma is that... That's one like, down from alpha, do the, alpha, alpha is, is like, more like clear focus ability, but okay. uh, gamma is where it's like pure raw intuition flow. Right. Okay. And gamma so is the like, rare one where it's basically right. a flat line. Your brain, you can look at this on so actual brain scans. It's pretty crazy. Sorry. So because the music, no, thank you. Because the music was created from that brainwave state that when people listen to it, it will entrain them into, into that brainwave state, which is why music is so important. And the way that the music was made can be so important. And so improvisational music for us as a community at Wonderland is, is a spiritual practice for us, is a huge doorway that we just like open the floodgates for any people that want to come and play with us to experience you know, the journey of getting into that flow state, which by the way, I just want to say thank you so much for bringing that metaphor, not metaphor, like actual wave frequency <laughs> hitting the source at the higher, that that's just like, oh, I had never um, known that before. And that is going to stay with me and it feels very relevant. So that kind of, as you know, relating that to music and how to the creative process to me is like really the juiciest thing. It's not about what we create. Like that's, it's like, okay, yeah, the byproduct is just like the, the painting or the song is just a byproduct of the realm of cultivation of, of self transformation. Like for me, music is a medium for my self-transformation because it's inside my creative process that I see myself the most clear, that I see where I'm afraid of that central source place or what takes me out of the moment and then what brings me back in. It's, it is the metaphor for me to kind of understand how I can live more creatively and walk through the world from a more relaxed brainwave state that has fluidity and intuition, imagination, creativity as I'm, you know, navigating the synchronicities of life. 
And so it's like a cultivation practice of navigating all of the interference inside of what comes up in a group when your voice is going to be heard or when they just did something amazing or when you missed the note, you know, and it's this language of learning how we communicate as people with each other. And I could go on and on just riffing on that, but maybe to get some more specific is that for us, the music that we have created and the experiences that we've created in, in the sharing of our music is always with the liberating intent of connectivity, of uh, consciousness, of heart, of coming back into the spiritual center and then rocking life out. And so Theo, my partner, uh, he's kind of the mastermind behind Entheo. And, you know, Theo, Entheo, he was a solo artist when I met him. And then he decided, we decided to become a duo. And so um, he's like the technical producer, um, magician behind it all, and really carries the thread of like, you know, opening up his channel to divine and receiving all manner of beauty. And for me, I'm more the like catalyzing muse like person inside of our dynamic that's like bringing a lot of dy dynamism and soul into the expression. And then, you know, my critical, rarefied like ear that can help to refine the music but um it's an amazing thing to be inside of collaboration that's one of my favorite subjects so there's entheo and then wonderland as a group has been uh creating music together improvisationally and doing all sorts of fun shows with oracles and people come up and draw cards and we improvise music as they're reading and all sorts wow. of wow yeah so uh, we're coming about to the end of our allotted time here. I want to really thank you for sticking around for the plus extension that is exclusive to our Patreon subscribers. And we went a lot deeper into um, this golden path and walking this self transformation through recognizing the shadow and uh, unlocking our higher potential as people and as a species and um, sort of the difference between uh, exterior morality and interior conscience and it's been really fun and I, I hope we get to do a conversation like this again but uh, would you go ahead and maybe give people some places where they can look up your work and uh, things you might want to let them know about yeah of course I mean I so I am a part of a team called Wonderland where Gene Keys Wonderland um, when we associate with the Gene Keys we have a whole website um, that you can find all of the interesting events and courses and music and videos that we create as well as one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions. Um, I work a lot with the overlay of astrology and your natal birth chart and transits with uh, the gene keys. So that's always a really fun journey as well as I love just introducing people into their sequences. So you can find that at genekeys.wonderland.com. And I think that Chance, you'll probably post some links in, is that what you do? Yeah, in the show notes and on the uh, website page and okay. on Great. social media when I share it, there'll be links everywhere. <laughs> awesome. Okay, links everywhere. So there's that. Um, we are doing the Pearl online virtual retreat, which is just starting. So if you want to jump in, then it's perfect time. You can find that on courses um, inside of the Gene Keys Wonderland website. Um, I will also plug my Patreon because I do a show called Gene Key of the Day and that's been running for two and a half years. And I basically, for the first year, I tracked the sun as it moved through every single Gene Key uh, throughout the year. So for instance, right now, the sun is in the 43rd Gene Key that moves from the shadow of deafness to insight and epiphany. And wow. over the years, I decided, I know it's a really good one, um, a sudden flash of insight. Um, over the years, though, I started to really focus on the lunar uh, cycles. So 
Lately, I've been focusing on full moon placements, new moons, and just really looking at the relevancy of any of the planetary positions that come in and share themselves and say, hey, this is an actual, a relevant theme to where we're at and what are the clues and the insight and wisdom we can uh, glean from that to better navigate our path ahead. So Gene Key of the Day, uh, I have a Patreon page for that and that's um, patreon.com slash Amelie Grace. I also have a YouTube page that you can subscribe to with Amelie Grace as well. So you can find those links and I'm thinking, oh, there's one more. So, well, a couple more. We create a Jinkies calendar. So look for this on the shop. We have a 2000, this is the calendar that tracks like where we are and what Jinky it is and where the full moons and new moons. And it features the art of Eric Nez, who's a dear brother and Wonderland community member. Um, so we're going to have this next run out so you can get them before Christmas for gifts as well. We created a gene key of the day game, which is phenomenal. So cool. And also doubles as an astrological educational tool inside of the gene keys wisdom. So, um, I'll post the shop, um, in the link so you can see that. Shoot me an last- email with that stuff if you don't mind, and then I'll really get it out there. I will. Yeah. And so then the last thing I'll share is I got um, my friend Leela Starr designed these epic DNA keys. I've been wearing my pendant. It's a a DNA key with a flower of of life top. And so these pendants are just super magical, um, beautiful living, living temples. I'll also mention soundcloud.com slash Entheo. Oh, yeah. Entheo. So SoundCloud, Entheo, um, we have Bandcamp, um, search Entheo. We have so many albums out and we have a lot of meditation music. Uh, we have dance music, we have acoustic songs, but we have a lot of like awesome meditation music. It's great for massage or ritual or anything like that. So check it out. It's some of the best stuff I have heard. And Theo is really the mastermind behind a lot of that. So Cool. Uh, Well, this has been a whole lot of fun. I feel like I learned quite a bit in this conversation too, which is what I expected and kind of why I wanted to bring this to others. So um, thanks for helping me create something that will probably be equally or more beneficial to a lot of people uh, if we can just get it out there to them. Awesome. Chance, thank you so much. Thank you for living this spark in your heart and knowing that this was your a calling to do a podcast like this. It's really special to be a part of it. And I'm so grateful to have this time with you and look forward to more. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do it again in a little, like maybe a few months. So thanks a lot. Uh, much love and um, may the force of spiritual evolution and compassion and empathy and love be with you all. Well, guys, I don't know about you, but I find the topic that we were on with this podcast episode incredibly fascinating. Looking for the correlations in the external world to your internal processes and personal evolution is always going to lead to some crazy synchronicity. We really expanded on the whole golden path aspect of the Gene Keys system in the Plus extension, and I'm sure we go deeper into many other things as well. So if that's something you want to get on, Go to patreon.com forward slash interverse and you can subscribe to become a plus member and get the extended episodes every week and early access. Of course, you can find the link to that in the episode notes as well as all the links to One Door Land, the Entheo SoundCloud page, and all the other things Amelie Grace is up to, including her Patreon and YouTube pages. I'm really happy I get to put out an episode like this for you guys because it's something that I've wanted to talk about on the show for a long time, astrology, and it finally happened, and I think that we'll probably get more of it if you like this type of thing. So, you know anybody? Suggest some good guest candidates to me, guys. I wouldn't mind at all. And if you like the show and you want to support it, but you can't shell out any money over Patreon to get some of the bonus features that subscribers are granted, then... There are some free ways you can help us out. Share the podcast on social media, tell somebody you know about it in person, or even go leave us a five-star review on iTunes. That one's actually really helpful. 
this podcast thing isn't going to go anywhere without you guys helping me out. And so I appreciate all the little bits of boosting and supporting that I get from all my friends. And thank you so much. I love you guys. And stay tuned for a super good episode next week with Brandon Beecham of the Positive Head Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm done for now. Talk to you soon. Love you guys. The 47th Gene Key. This 47th Gene Key is really fascinating. And it points towards one of the greatest problems of humankind, the issue and the purpose of suffering. Most people live their lives without even realizing that they are suffering. We unconsciously try to escape feeling it in so many different ways, through work, through the many distractions of our senses, and through the multitude of projections of our mind onto the world and those around us. The fact is that you can only come face to face with your suffering when you embrace your aloneness. That's when you begin to claim ownership of your suffering. So most people manifest their karma externally and wonder why this is happening to them. And that's where they feel oppressed. And they don't own their own karma and therefore they become a victim of it. It's your awareness, it's your breathing, it's your presence that burns the karma off. And this is the great mystery of alchemy. But you have to own the shadow you carry, even though it's not really you at all. It just comes with the vehicle. Your oppression, the particular nuances and flavors of your suffering and your karma during this lifetime are exactly equivalent to the greatness of your inner light. In fact, their purpose is to awaken that light. Transmutation is an ongoing process and many mutations make up a transmutation. Many small breakthroughs lead to bigger breakthroughs as more and more trapped, oppressed light is released from within our DNA. The gift of transmutation occurs more and more as you enter into the present moment. Once you become aware of your oppression, of your suffering, it becomes more and more acute. And wherever you go, there it is inside you, a divine ache, a kind of deep, restless longing to remember something. So the genius of the 47th gift is that it thrives on adversity. At its higher reaches, it really embraces challenges with glee. Because you know when another shadow appears, that that shadow contains more light for you, you welcome them and you draw them deeper and deeper inside you with graciousness. And all transmutation takes place in the belly, in the cauldron of the belly. Because here all karma is burned from our DNA and transformed. And this is why we keep returning down to the belly over and over again, because this is where it's all happening. Adversity is all about time. It takes a long time to burn all that ancestral anguish that you carry. Your body and your life may even become the battlefield for it to play out in. But you can trust in the process. Because what film or book or drama or good story about overcoming adversity do you know that doesn't take almost forever to conclude itself? It's always right at the end. You know, our lives are an allegory for the playing out of consciousness as it burrows into the form, 
transmutes and digests it before its true nature can be fully realized. Ah, I love these stories. And all great stories end in redemption. There's always a period of innocence, the great trial where we're tested to our limits, and then finally there's the atonement. This 47th gene key, all those little mutations that occur as our awareness transforms the shadow on a daily basis, lead to the great transmutations. And these great transmutational periods are usually very intense, and they become more and more intense as our frequency rises into the gift frequency and beyond. Contemplation, that state in which your awareness is turning inwards on a regular basis, gives way to absorption. And when this stage is reached, you know. You know because your whole frequency begins to move into another realm. The intensity remains, but your life becomes at the same time softer, quieter, and your effort begins to drop away. occurring is that your genetic memory is being cleansed, purged, expunged, and as it falls away, a new being is literally emerging in its midst, and you become suffused with your own presence, with your essence, and your awareness is now so inward that it comes to a point of complete rest, and then magic occurs. You reach the center. It's about victory. It's about redemption. It's the sun coming out after the storm. It's the great leveler. That only those who really own their own suffering and own their own destiny really bring their life to this kind of a peak. ready once again to embrace the magical realm, the state we originally came from. And all it takes is a few transfigurations and the game is up. You're permanently altered. Transfer.